Thank you for joining our webinar today. This has been something long in the making. We're very excited. Um, I'm Cynthia Cabrera. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Hometown Hero. We're hosting this webinar. We're just super stoked about this. Just to be clear, this, none of this is legal advice. We're just sharing information. You always should consult with your own legal counsel if you have any specific questions. But we wanted to do this to share with everybody. We're going to go around with all our presenters and have them introduce themselves now, and then we'll get started. Lucas? Hi, I'm Lucas Gilkey. I'm the CEO of Hometown Hero. Uh, a lot of you are customers of ours, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're here simply today to give you more information, like we've been doing sort of every week for the past few weeks, give you more information on what's going on in Texas, what's going on on the federal side, and just, just make it very clear with you guys kind of what we're doing and what our strategy is going forward for this year. Hi, I'm Craig Kalko with Westfront Strategies. We're a small lobbying firm based in Washington, D.C., and we represent Hometown Hero uh, in front of Congress and the administration. Uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing my perspectives on what's happening in politics and in D.C. Uh, as it relates to the hemp industry. Hello, my name is Tammy Wall, and I also have a government relations shop in D.C. I work with Craig and his team. Um, we represent Hometown Hero in DC. And uh, uh, I know we'll get into this, but the, the bringing that voice for this particular industry sector is new to DC. And so it's been exciting to pick up on the leadership from Hometown. Um, by trade, I've worked in multiple FDA product categories. And so this is a burgeoning sector right here. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. and. Feel free to, answer, to send on those questions. Hi, I'm Jody. I'm attending remotely. My name is Jody McGinnis. I'm uh, with the Hemp Industries Association, which is a national uh, trade association for all of hemp. Uh, and uh, we represent businesses and farms and supporters who want to maximize the potential of hemp as an agricultural commodity. We've been around since 1994. We've taken on some big fights against the DEA when they've attempted to meddle with, with hemp. And uh, really glad to be here with uh, allies and friends to talk about these important issues today. Jody, if you could real quick, let people know how they can become a member and how they can contribute to HIA, because I think that's really important. Thanks. Uh, certainly, please visit our website. It's thehia, T-H-E-H-I-A dot org. And uh, it should be pretty self-explanatory there. But um, you can become a member for as little as 250 as a business for the entire year. And it comes with a whole host of benefits, including um, uh, uh, meetings like this that are informative and in education and finding resources in your local uh, uh, state. So um, again, that's the HIA.org and um, uh, feel free to uh, hit the contact button if you have any questions and we'll respond to you promptly. Good stuff, thank you, Jody. So I think where we're going to start today is with the Farm Bill. I mean, we get so many questions about it here at the office, people call in, that kind of thing, and it's always a subject of discussion no matter where we go. So I'm gonna start with that. So Craig, can you tell us what the 2018 Farm Bill is, kind of like how it works, that kind of thing? Yes, so the Farm Bill, which is passed by Congress typically about every five years, is an extremely broad piece of legislation that sets agricultural and rural policy for the country. Uh, it also includes uh, policy on the food stamp program and nutrition programs. It's one of those, you know, multi-hundred thousand page bills that you sort of hear about uh, in the news from time to time. Uh, but it's one that actually you know, is very important across the country and of course to our industry. Uh, specifically in 2018, the Farm Bill is where hemp was legalized at the federal level. And now we're five years later, where all of the policies from that uh, piece of legislation are gonna be revisited. Some may change, many may not change. Uh, so we're gonna get into that uh, in detail. Jody, do you have anything on the Farm Bill? That pretty well covers it. It, was, uh, it, it amended the definition of hemp uh, for, um, for the federal government, which was established way back in 1946 um, in something called the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1946. So they edited that and they edited the Controlled Substances Act with the Farm Bill to uh, specifically uh, define or exclude hemp from the list of controlled substances, along with all of its derivatives, isomers, et cetera. So Craig, are there, is there potential for change in the 2018 Farm Bill in 2023? 
Yes, there is potential for change. There is interest among you know, various interest groups in our industry and from, without, uh, from outside the industry in making changes, but it's, it's very unclear at this point. It's, it's gonna be a long process. The bill will be discussed and talked about for the next few months before it is formally introduced. Then there's gonna be months of debate, be marked up by being edited and, and debated by committees in Congress then it'll have to be approved by both the Senate and the House. None of that is guaranteed. You know, we don't even know if, if a farm bill will pass. Sometimes Congress is unable to make you know, forward progress on issues, and what they'll do is just sort of extend what uh, they had agreed to previously. So keeping all the policies in place you know, going forward. So there could be changes made to the definition of hemp, uh, but we don't know what they would be. They could be, they could be positive for us, they could be neutral for us, you know, and that's you know something we're keeping incredibly close uh, eye on uh, as hometown hero at HIA uh, with our activities in Washington meeting with members of Congress and their staffs meeting with the administration to make sure that we're protecting our industry so is it possible that the farm bill wouldn't change that the, the, the part pertaining to hemp wouldn't change absolutely absolutely possible um, you know, there will probably be people that will, or members of Congress specifically, that, that may suggest changes, uh, but they're going to have to work with members of, of both parties and both chambers, and there may not be enough focus or interest in making the change for it to actually happen. Um, again, it's, it's something we're going to you know, watch as it develops and, and make our priorities known. Jody, what would be a positive change for the industry? Well, the current definition of hemp sets a very tight 0.3% uh, limit on the Delta 9 THC content, and it would make life a lot easier for farmers if they raised that to something like a 1% uh, THC cap. Uh, that would be something that would be improved. There was a really onerous provision in the way that they authorized hemp last time, uh, which essentially is institutional racism. It, it, it prevents anybody with a, um, a felony conviction uh, within the last 10 years from getting a license um, to, to grow or process hemp. Um, and given the inequities of the war on drugs and how much harder that's hit minority communities over the years, that's essentially shutting, uh, uh, shutting the door to a lot of business owners uh, who you know, might want to get involved and be entrepreneurs themselves. So uh, change that, getting rid of that provision would be a definite improvement. And there are some other things, uh, including funding for uh, fiber processing and research um, uh, that, that we're looking for as priorities. But you know, the, the key is to not, not meddle too much with the definition of hemp, because that would very much upset uh, the entire industry. So, Lucas, as a business owner, would you like to see the 2018 bill stay the way it is, or is there something that you'd like to see that would help industry, or do you just prefer the status quo? Uh, so, as, as a business owner, I always prefer things to stay the same because it's impossible to plan around the unknown, right? Just from a simple business perspective, it allows us to be more strategic and plan better when we actually know sort of what this is going to look like over the next few years. Um, so my preference would be really there's not a lot of change. Uh, if they raise the limit from 0.3 to, to 1, that would be phenomenal. It would be a huge help for a lot of people. But other than that, my preference would be that it doesn't, it doesn't greatly change. Everything just stays the same. Yeah. Okay. So, Tammy, the farm bill basically exempted hemp, gave it the formal definition of hemp, but there's still a lot of confusion about it. There are a lot of business owners on this call right now or on this meeting right now. What do you think is the best way for them? And I'm sure that they understand what it is, the difference, but what do you recommend for them to explain to people the difference between hemp and marijuana and how they should kind of like approach this with their consumers? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you, Cynthia. And interestingly, uh, for people that are attending, your conversations that you have with the end user or the purchaser, it's similar or, um, it's similar to the messaging that we do on the Hill because we're dealing with members that aren't versed in this or that aren't working in this space 24 seven. And so the messaging is somewhat the same. Uh, and it, so because this is a new industry sector, all of you are on the front line and you are best positioned to allay those concerns from the consumers and to answer those questions. And so consumer confusion is, um, because of the way our laws are written, we have a THC dominant, which is cannabis, which is the proper 
Latin binomial, but it's been used, marijuana is street slang, or that's even in the Controlled Substances Act. So you have the THC dominant, and then you have hemp, which is where the 0.3% on the THC, and that's, that's the space that we're playing in right now. So just a couple of tips from a retail setting, or if you're in a position where you sell pro finished product to an end user, that um, because this is a new industry, and there, so there's a little bit of lift on this, but uh, I think this would be very helpful for the consumer, is you know, to take the time and have those conversations, be consistent with your terminology and vernacular, and then um, any type of local or state level engagement that you have, whether it's general community engagement, where you can um, continue to explain and educate the, the differences, that would always be helpful. Uh, and then certainly know your brand, because the, between the THC dominant and, and hemp, um, they can be conflated. Again, if you're not in this industry, they're very easy to conflate. And so uh, know your brand, because that we may have some outliers out there that like to, um, to conflate to their own benefit. And so it's a heavy lift, but again, because you are on the front line, if you can take the time and have those conversations now, I think we're, it's part of that broader educational campaign, just as we're doing it on the Hill, to really explain the difference. And perhaps um, the, on that long-term play is that you're creating a product category. You're creating um, a new lane, and Hometown Heroes done a bang-up job on that, on um, trying to be very articulate about hemp-derived versus that THC dominant. That's awesome. So kind of related to that, and we'll get everybody else, but Tammy, sticking with you for a second. So the Safe Banking Act, I realize that that has to do with marijuana, not hemp. But if we look at the industry in general, there are a lot of people and businesses that have um, suffered for being in the hemp industry. Um, Craig or you, Tammy, what, what do you think are the possibilities? I mean, is there anything that we can do to help the hemp industry? Well, the, the Safe Banking Act, uh, as you said, may not directly impact um, many of the people on this call or us directly or immediately, but it, its passage would, I think, go a long way towards normalizing, legitimizing in the eyes of those who question our industry it, I think it'll bring it more mainstream and, and reduce a, a lot of the friction that the businesses, I think, feel on a very sort of general level. Um, it, it has a, it's a bill that has a lot of bipartisan support in Congress. Uh, it, it looked as though it might get passed at the end of last year. It didn't quite make it, uh, but it will be back. It's championed uh, most prominently by the Senate Majority Leader, which is of all people, the person you would want pushing it. Unfortunately, he cannot you know, do it alone and get it across the finish line, but you will see further attempts uh, to get it passed. I think it would just be positive for the, the entire cannabis uh, ecosystem. And it looks like Jody uh, wanted to jump in. I just wanted to chime in because you know we've heard from our members and even experienced ourselves that despite the fact that hemp is fully legal, some you know conservative lending institutions, some of the bigger banks, um, credit card processors, major credit card processors, continually uh, shut down uh, the services to hemp businesses because of uh, you know their lawyers tell them that there's there's a worry there. So the Safe Banking Act is intended to help the marijuana industry, but the hope is that its passage would stop that type of interference from 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 banks and credit card processors, which is a real detriment to, to businesses, even in the hemp industry, which, um, you know, the HIA, we're a trade association. We don't even, we're not a plant touching business. And we had our credit card processing shut down twice in 2022, uh, just because of the association with the word hemp. And that's despite the fact that it's been legal since 2018. And there's no, there's no arguing with those, those institutions. It's sort of a, you have to you have to just find another solution, and that's a that's a real impediment to to business and, and entrepreneurship. So we're hopeful. Well, just to follow up on that, so there there is that financial component both in the on the the cannabis side and the in the hemp industry. The the other thing that we are keeping an eye on with the safe banking legislation or some iterative um, version of it is that uh, 
random provisions that can be inserted into that safe banking uh, bill. And so even though it's intended to cover, to open financial, um, to open the financial institutions for both of these industries, um, you know, you, you can have the random provision inserted at the last minute, and sometimes that is favorable and sometimes not. So there's the core, bar core bill, and then there are the random provisions as well. As a business, have consumers been impacted or individuals been impacted by the way members of the hemp industry are treated? Yeah, we've heard quite a bit. Um, one of the standard recommendations I make to people, especially around merchant processing, is don't, don't do merchant processing or really business with a lot of banks with a business name that has hemp or any cannabis related words in that name. Uh, it's going to cause problems. It's caused problems for us, it's caused problems for some of our vendors, it's caused problems for some of my friends in the industry. Um, I've heard of a variety of different things. I've heard of people being denied for car loans. I've heard of people being denied for life insurance. I've heard of people being denied for a pretty wide variety of things that are actually doing business in the industry, uh, which is disheartening to say the least, but I, I do think at some point we will get past that. We just aren't there yet. Okay, thank you. So we actually have somebody who asked a question circling back to the farm bill. So I guess, Craig, if it does pass, is there a timeline for when it would take effect, the farm bill, 2023? Good question. Uh, and not, not a simple answer. Uh, as I mentioned, the bill will be over 1,000 pages touching you know, scores, hundreds of, of different policy areas. So in some cases, it will depend on when the prior authorizations take place. But generally speaking, it will take effect you know, shortly after it, it becomes law, which you know is likely the end of you know the end towards the end of this year. So I, you know, I think you're looking probably most likely around you know beginning of 2024 or early 2024. Okay, and that is a good segue into the next thing I wanted to bring up, which is kind of just talking about the states, what's going on in the different states, what we can look forward to all these sessions that are you know working right now including texas which has a session every other year which is so civilized um so okay what happens wh what are your thoughts and then we'll go to the the business side and and uh hia what are your thoughts at the federal level about you know, laws that are made at the federal level, but then the states come in and they make their own levels. I mean, marijuana is a good example of that, but now we have, for example, hemp-derived products, which are fully legal, but some states have taken steps to restrict them in some manner or something. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I would just uh, make the point that state laws can often become models for federal law. Um, you know, they, I think the phrase is that the states are the, the laboratory of, of democracy. Um, you know, 50 states can pass 50 different laws in a lot of different areas, which sometimes can be good for business, often can be terrible for business. Um, so in, in looking to push federal policy um, or federal priorities for us, it's important not only what happens in that state, but that, that how the laws passed in certain states can affect federal law. Often members of Congress will look to their own states and say, okay, well, this happened in my state, uh, so, and, and it worked out well for, for whatever industry is impacted. I'm gonna bring that to Congress and try to push that at the federal level. Or conversely, they can see things go wrong in their state and be like, I'm gonna try to fix that at the federal level. So uh, you know, so my expertise is at the federal level, uh, but we keep an eye on the states to the extent that it can impact what Congress does. Tammy? I totally echo, for sure, 100%. And um, the efforts that are going on on the state level right now for this particular industry sector have been key and quite critical on keeping the conversation alive in DC because the, um, you know, D8 or certain other cannabinoids can carry a headline and that's all that is picked up in DC. It's, it is that headline, but the main street economies, the businesses on your main street, if you will, that, you know, that is this industry and that does not, uh, that message those numbers don't get carried into D.C. And so to counter that headline is something immediate. It's exactly what Craig said. We can point to different state programs. Um, and now we loosely we have job numbers. We have economic impact numbers. All of that is very important. And so um, and you can even look at other industry sectors where these laboratories of democracy have actually um, 
they've been model in on the DC level and they've also preserved your in the industry sector and in this case this particular industry sector so it's critical Jody do you have any thoughts on that sure I mean the the way that hemp was legalized it was essentially decriminalized and states weren't forced to legalize it themselves. They were given the opportunity, but to do that, they had to come up with a plan. So you have 50 different plans to um, based on, on the state and, and each one is tackling these issues in, in a different way. I think it's vitally important that um, business owners are active in their states and in their communities. Um, being a part, you know, uh, Tammy mentioned, you know, integrating with the community and educating, but it's also about reaching out to your, lo your local representative and letting them know that these issues are important to you, trying to get a meeting and talk to talk about, you know, the importance of these products to your business and uh, making, making your voice heard. And that's really the key to, to, uh, to sustaining the growth of the, of the sector of the industry. Well, that's great because just just to touch on Texas real quick. I was getting there. <laughs> so I apologize. You're fine. <laughs> so you know we've done we've run the numbers in Texas. There's over three thousand registered hemp product retailers within Texas, and if you do some simple math and say, well, you know the average store employs probably about three people. I mean, really quick, really quickly, we're getting close to ten thousand jobs just in Texas. That's one state. So if you start looking at this from a nationwide perspective, I mean, theoretically, there's a lot of jobs. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of stores. There's a lot of businesses. There's a lot of families that depend on this industry and are very proud to be a part of it and want, it to, see, want to see it continue. So, um, and that's one thing that we're really gonna start pushing on, especially in Texas. And we recommend for those of you in other states, Look at that angle as well. Figure out how many registered stores there are in your state. Because in Texas, when you do the math, it turns into a really big number really quickly. And nobody wants to cut jobs right now, right? There's a lot of industries cutting jobs. Our industry's thriving. Our industry's hiring. We're hiring people at our company. I know people in stores right now are hiring as well. This is a growing industry. So nobody wants to harm a growing industry right now. I think that's something that really works in our favor. So why don't we stay on Texas for a minute? I mean, I would... I have a list here of battleground states and I have Texas at the top of it. Yeah. What are your thoughts about going into this, this session here in Texas? Uh, we're, we're the most confident we've ever been. And the reason is, is because of the people that we're working with. I mean, we have so many smart people. Um, everybody at this table is, is brilliant in what they do. We're bringing in the best strategists possible. We're bringing in the best lobbyists possible. This for us is, it's, it's always, it, it's a little extreme, but it's always a life or death fight for us, right? There is no, there is no sort of second place in this. We either win or we don't. So for us, it's always how do we win this and how do we win it confidently and without issue. So that's kind of the way we approach all of our fights is we go all in, give it everything that we have, and, and that's, that's kind of how we've been able to get to where we are. Yeah, losing is not an option. No, losing is not an option for us. Yeah. So somebody asked a question here also specific to Texas, and I'm not sure, I'm gonna read the question. It says, any insight, on the t any insight on the Texas hemp license and whether they will regulate businesses that sell hemp products like some convenience stores that don't have the licenses? I think they, this person, whoever wrote it, might have meant enforce rather than regulate because every retailer that sells hemp products in the state of Texas is supposed to be licensed. It's not and by expensive. the way, it's not an expensive license fee. And there's not even it's not even that crazy of an application. It's not. It's um, so if somebody's selling hemp products and they aren't licensed in Texas, please go get licensed. Uh, it's not a complicated process, and it actually I think it, it helps the industry quite a bit in Texas. The more of us there are. Yeah. So while we're talking about crazy states, my hometown or where I was born, um, Tammy, uh, New York. So somebody had a question about New York, and uh, it says, even though the Farm Bill allows uh, federal regulation, what do you see happening at the state level, like in New York, where they ban certain products, even though they're federally legal, New York has done it. Uh, there's another question, any info on New York and Delta 9? Um, that's not very specific, so I'm not sure what the question is, but do you have any information on New York State? Well, well um but yes and no, and again, these vague answers, right, which is super comfortable for us to give vague answers, but not 
probably exactly what you want to hear. So uh, New York, because they just stood up their program, it will be somewhat of an iterative process. And um, in addition to that, I'm sorry, Ken. If everybody could please mute their, if everyone could please mute, mute if everyone could please mute their um, microphones, that would be super awesome. Thank you so much. Tammy? Yeah, thank you. What, um, so we do expect to see changes, and there have been, even with other areas within that New York program, there, you know, some new pressure points. And so we'll see at the, change, the changes as they come, but I do think, um, I mean, hopefully it'll be more favorable. It's, again, it's the, the laboratory, they're gonna give something a go, and now they're getting pressure because certain things aren't working up there. Uh, different business interests are applying some pressure. So we'll, we'll see what comes. And apologies for the vague response on that, but efforts are underway, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> so there are some battleground states that we've identified, Minnesota, Louisiana, Virginia, obviously Texas. And we're gonna talk about that some more because somebody asked another specific question. But I would like to say something, even though I'm the one asking questions. I look at a lot of draft legislation for different states and different bills and that kind of thing. And we were talking last night about how the marijuana industry was kind of like born with Stockholm Syndrome, right? So they were, they, they got this reprieve from different states and like, okay, we're gonna legalize you, but just to make sure that the federal government doesn't like really come down on us, we're gonna be so onerous in our regulations that ultimately in places like, you know, California, for example, you're not even gonna be able to make any money. Like the black market is much more, much larger in California and it thrives versus the legal industry, right? So my thoughts for the hemp industry, which is fully federally legal, is that as an industry, we have got to stop acting like we're a bunch of criminals asking for a pardon, right? I look at draft legislation from different states and people will tie themselves in knots and with all these regulations and all these requirements and model things like that come directly out of marijuana, which is federally illegal, and they will model uh, legislation like this and then you know, submit it to their states. So what they do is they go right to the states and they go, hey, we believe that we are some kind, we're a minor version of the criminal that marijuana is, but if we're, but look at all these restrictions we're gonna put on ourselves, please let us live. Well, stop doing that. Because we are a fully federally legal program. We deserve reasonable and rational regulation. That's it, full stop. We don't have to beg for anything. We don't need to go in like we have to give up the world just so that we can get you know, heard. And if we could be consistent about this, I think our industry would do a lot better. So that's just, that's my take on it. That being said, this industry is way more organized than it was two years ago. Uh, you know, when we went into the last legislative session, it, 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 was, it was a little painful trying to figure all this out and trying to organize people. And, you know, making frantic calls to help try and raise more money and kind of, it was, it was not as organized as I would have hoped it would have been. But we've been organizing now and building our strategy and building our team for the last year in preparation for this legislative session. This is, we're playing at a different level now. This is a completely different level. And a lot of it's thanks, thanks to Cynthia and everybody in this room that has allowed us to kind of up our game and play at a different level. And now we're also working with you know, the largest companies in our industry are working now with us as allies, and we're all on the same page, and we're all rowing in the same direction. So I'm more confident in where we are as an industry than I've ever been in the past. I love it. Okay, we're still on the states. So somebody asked a question here, and I kind of just want to throw it up in the air. I'm not sure which one of you is going to jump for it first, but it's pretty juicy. If nobody jumps, I'm going in. Um, so the question is, how come in every state where medical marijuana becomes legal, I see D8, D9 uh, from hemp being outlawed. Is there a chance D8, and then follow up, D8, D10, 
THCA are all banned in the Farm Bill? So these are two separate questions. So let's stay with the state one for a second. So how come in every state where we see medical marijuana become legal, suddenly hemp-derived products are at risk? Someone better jump in because I know Some, Cynthia is somebody biting. Somebody jump in here, <laughs> jump in here. Jody. I to jump in if that's all right. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, states that have established adult use marijuana programs, um, one of two things is happening. They're, they're either um, taking hemp cannabinoids and putting them into their marijuana program, or they're seeking to ban them and just keep you know, only the sale of their product available. And neither of which is very fair. And that's happening because because those states have established marijuana lobbies that have a lot of power that, uh, you know, in Colorado and uh, elsewhere, these, these, these state, these programs are bringing in a lot of money and they've, they've got, in some cases, armies of, of lobbyists and they have a head start in building relationships with legislators. So um, it's unfortunate and it, and it's a real lost opportunity because as Cynthia mentioned, uh, hemp doesn't suffer from from the the same uh, burden of being a federally illegal product. So hemp owner, uh, hemp business owners, hemp farmers, hemp entrepreneurs shouldn't have to be saddled with the same regulatory burdens, the same limited market uh, end markets going through dispensaries only. Um, those things shouldn't be happening. And and to the extent that it's possible, we we have uh, you know written letters and and advocated uh, to to try and stop that from happening. But that is that is sort of the gravitational pull. It's almost um, it's almost inevitable that it's either going to be swept into that that marijuana category or or somehow uh, uh, regulated out of existence. So that's that that's what's happening, and that's why it's happening. Um, but it uh, it you know. Legislation is is iterative, right? I mean, that may be the law now. We may be at a position now where we are um, sort of like in World War II, where you know the Allies got chased to Dunkirk and then they had to go across the English Channel and then come back and kick the Nazis' butts. Like we might be at that position now, where we're just regrouping, securing the the land we've taken, and then we're going to launch our counteroffensive and start getting back some of those markets. Because I think, you know, um, there there's no like I said, no reason. Uh, uh, from the federal perspective, that 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 this these products need to be treated like marijuana. So, Lucas, as a business owner, how do you approach? What what are your thoughts about the medical marijuana industry or the recreational marijuana industry versus you know as a, you're you own a hemp company? So, what are your thoughts there? It's in my opinion, it's different industries and it's different products. Um, we also serve different people. So. Largely, you know, we've got a pretty diverse customer base, uh, but it is a lot of people going through medical issues, a lot of veterans, you know, just a, a wide variety of groups that want to use these products for some kind of some kind of relief. Um, you know, and, and I guess you could argue in the marijuana industry, it's, it's essentially the same thing. It's people looking for relief from whatever they're dealing with. So, you know, for us, it's really about how do we best serve the, the people that uh, don't, you know, we serve a lot of people in different states that don't have access to marijuana. And these are people that, you know, in my opinion, they should, but that's, that's neither here nor there. We have to be very neutral on marijuana and allow it to do its thing because we are a separate industry and what we do and how we handle things and we have to treat it that way. So, you know, the two, the two are very different. Um, you know, is there overlap? We haven't really seen a lot of overlap and this is where it gets weird with the marijuana industry is, you know, they don't want us in states that they are sort of, you know, trying to turn into a marijuana state. We're finding that they're fighting to get rid of us and doing all this different stuff. But from what we've seen, it, it has little to no impact on their business and it has little to no impact on our business, whether or, na whether or not a state has legalized medicinal or recreational marijuana. Tim, did you have something? No, well, just to follow up on what Lucas was saying about different product categories, different end users, um, and Again, because this is a new industry sector, we're in the very early days of defining that category. And so, and we will talk about product standards and what has been done both on the hill and boots on the ground within hometown and other brands on defining that particular category. There is ample market space for everyone. And it is unfortunate that there has been some sharp elbows coming from you know, other parts of the, uh, you know, the broader industry. But, um, and what Jody said as far as if we lose markets, we can always, you know, try to go back and get them. But the, I think the product standards that Hometown has been developing and, you know, trying to um, gain some industry adoption on those, that will go a long way to help really define this new category sector. 
just as a follow-up, it seems because uh, one particular state that we deal with, Louisiana, um, the medical lobby there, the medical marijuana lobby there, really is just coming after us. They really, they tried it last session, they're gonna try it again this session. And it seems like in a lot of states, there's like a, almost like a monopoly on the medical marijuana licenses, and it's almost like they don't even want recreational, much less us. Well, the interesting thing about the medicinal and rec marijuana industries is they, in a, in a lot of cases these days, it's no longer small companies. Um, you know, we're seeing much larger corporations become involved, and whether it's as a shareholder or actually the owners of the company, we're seeing it, it very much sort of monopolized and, and, you know, corporatized into these sort of big MSOs that run a bunch of things. And, you know, it's, it's not, I don't think it's a lot of what people typically perceive that the marijuana industry would be. It's largely turned into these large corporations that right. sort of run these industries. Yeah. And they don't like us. They want to get rid of us. And so, you know, we're constantly getting into battles with them, which is unfortunate. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it, in nature, it's the same plant, right? Marijuana and hemp in nature are all cannabis sativa L. It's literally the same plant. Hemp and marijuana are government regulations that were created based on the level of THC in the plant itself. Would you all agree that, like, if you think back, I mean, you know, obviously none of us were there, I don't think, for the inception of this, but if you think back to, like, the idea of the people who were fighting for um, marijuana legalization, it kind of seems like those people have morphed into the people, into the, like the big MSOs and the big, you know, big marijuana, the big corporations. And now hemp is like fighting like big marijuana to try to stay, I mean, yeah. is, that, is that just my, you think the same way? I 100% I agree with that. It seems like, you know, what you would perceive as sort of the, you know, the 70s pro marijuana people, I, it almost feels like that side of, of cannabis has evolved into the hemp industry. Yeah. The hemp industry is, is doing more advancements on the technology side, more advancements, um, you know, on, on figuring out what different cannabinoids do and developing, you know, new cannabinoids and figuring out what they do. And that we're seeing more advancement from hemp than we are from marijuana right now. Uh, and I don't think people fully, fully realize that either. So you used the word morphed, and what you know, some of the original um, stakeholders in the in the marijuana in the cannabis industry, they've either it, they've either morphed into the large corporate dollars or been pushed out, and that is definitely something as part of our messaging on the hill, the small business approach. Again, back to the main street, and so we are. You definitely see that in the hemp industry and the in the cannabinoid industry. You know, working with the U.S. hemp farmers and smaller startups and giving it a go and the innovation, because when you're smaller like that, you're nimble and you can have the innovation, which is, which is amazing. And so, um, what, to, but to try to keep that within the hemp industry is going to be, I, I think, really important because the 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 more user you get of these types of products, the you'll, you will have other dollars that will try to come into this industry, as we have seen in the marijuana industry. Yeah. So I want to ask Craig a question, and I know when I started working at Hometown Hero formally, because I, I used to cons I consulted for the company for years before I, I came on formally, but anyway, um, literally the first thing that Lucas and I did together, like literally the first thing, and Lucas was like, we have to do this, was join HIA, Hemp Industries Association, because we were looking for a national organization. We don't want to start anything new. It's such a heavy lift all that stuff, and HIA was the only one that believed what we believed, which was hemp-derived cannabinoids are legal, full stop, that's it. Stop begging for forgiveness, stop asking for permission, it's legal. And so we wanted to work and collaborate with somebody who had the same values and the same ideals that we did. So on that note, Craig, the follow-up question about the Farm Bill is, is there a chance that other minor cannabinoids like D8, D10, or even D9 or THC could be banned in the farm bill. And also, sorry, and this might be for Tammy, uh, how testing would be handled. And, so, and actually, I'm gonna throw that one to, to Jody, but go ahead. So on a theoretical basis. Theoretical basis. Sure, I mean, that is the venue in which changes will be made. I'm not concerned about any products being banned. There may be individual members of Congress that are looking to do that. I don't see that as something that can get through the process. 
at the federal <coughs> level, is there a lot of, um, like among lawmakers, mm -hmm. is there a lot of distinction or talk about marijuana versus hemp or that kind of thing, or do they not make that distinction? Is that not a conversation that happens often? I think it is a conversation that happens without much clarity. Without I, I much clarity. Yeah, I, I don't think um, most members of Congress fully understand the difference. I, uh, they may, to different degrees, some you know may think of hemp as you know something you're going to use to make clothing, or they may not realize you know the difference between CBD and you know is CBD the same as hemp? Is that the same as you know D nine? I just I don't think there's awareness of some of these matters, um, but I think there's just a lot of confusion. Okay, so there, you know there are certainly some members that are that are more expert, but the vast majority of them really need a lot of education, and that's what that's what we're doing. That's why. Hometown Hero is, is on the Hill talking to members of Congress. Yeah, thank you guys for doing that. Um, so Jody, following up on the same question that somebody submitted, so the follow-up, the second part of the question is, would D9 and THCA be treated different, differently since they can be naturally grown and don't use isomers? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, it, it's possible, but uh, it gets a little bit tricky uh, because the way that hemp was defined um, previously did not account for THCA, but the USDA's regulations, when they set out their testing regulations for hemp, did uh, account for THCA. So it's probably not the type of thing that they'll take on because it looks from from the cap from Capitol Hill, it looks like the the regulatory agency has come up with a solution. So so it's probably not that that specifically. Uh, where we might see something that touches on Delta 9 and, and TCA is uh, if they try to move to a total THC cap instead of a specific Delta 9 THC cap. So that would factor in THCA and, and you know, the, the small amounts of other uh, potential cannabinoids as well. Okay. Do you have anything on that? Okay. So I want to move on. We're running out of time, um, which is great because we're having a good conversation, but I want to make sure I get to as many of these as possible. So the FDA is starting to look at whether, you know, hemp is safe for food or whether it should be added to food or, you know, they're going to make recommendations. Tammy, what, what is the process for that to happen? How does that work? There are a few different ways for that to, um, to go down. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and one of the examples is what transpired with cannabidiol, with CBD. And that is an example of where FDA is sitting on the fence and they are, they put their foot to one side of the fence just enough to create market confusion and that forced states to enact their own CB, their own hemp derived CBD programs. Um, and the foot is on the other side of the fence where there is complete and utter regulatory confusion and chaos for brand holders, for consumers, and certainly for lawmakers on the Hill. And you know, in CBD, it's it, it's a little unique because we're dealing with a drug that was that's in the market and which product was first to market. So, um, but that's just an example of things that FDA can do without going through formal notice and comment rulemaking, without having a legislative directive. They just create this internal non-binding position, and it just creates utter chaos. So that's something that could happen. Another is they could issue a guidance document, um, and those are, they're not legally binding, and it's essentially an instruction to industry on FDA's position on certain things. You don't necessarily need to comply with that, although if you don't, enforcement actions, or um, it can get, again, it's just um, it's a broader gray area for you to play in, but there could be a guidance document. And, there, and then there, there are some, some legislative vehicles with FDA, whether it's through report language or um, explicit legislation that, that instructs the FDA on what to do. So dealing with this, with this particular industry sector, you know, we're watching multiple legislative vehicles, um, staying in contact with the FDA and then certain Hill members in large part because things can transpire in multiple ways. So Craig, the FDA is doing this because they were pushed by Congress, right? Uh, you know, I think, and another should weigh in, um, they, I mean, FDA has jurisdiction over these areas. Congress has delineated that to some extent through legislation. And Congress is to sort of the way the whole system works, regardless of industry or agency, Congress will set broad rules 
but they don't have the experts or um, sort of the, the time or capacity to make the specific details on how to implement the laws. So they delegate to the agencies to sort of fill in the, the fine print on, on the policy. So it could be years? Yes. It has been. It has yeah. been years. It already has been years. It has been yes, years. For, yes, it's been years. Okay. Which is why, Cynthia, if I may just add Please. on that. So, so there is one thing about industry just being like, oh, but, you know, federal government come up with something, tell us what to do. And then the flip of that is creating the industry, developing those best practices, and delivering a model to the agency, to Congress that will go to the agency, which is what's underway right now. But um, so as much as we have this patchwork of state programs, we have that regulatory chaos on the federal level, um, you know, the, the upside of that, if you will, is that industry can define what do you want your industry to look like. And I will say having, you know, I still have the scars from the vape industry. Uh, and uh, everything moved faster than we thought it was going to move, even though it moved very slowly. Everything still moved faster than we thought it was going to be. And all I can say, like the lesson learned from there is to like engage now and engage often. Like there's just no other way to not end up like that. I feel much better about the hemp industry than I do, you know. Um, there was also a lot of infighting in the vape industry oh my as well. Nobody could ever <laughs> agree on one strategy or one plan. And that's one of the things that's been a real blessing with this industry is, you know, the leading companies in this industry, we all know each other, we all have frequent conversations, we're all on the same page, we're all building together the same strategy on the federal and the state level, and it's very comforting to know that we all have each other's backs like that. It's, it's a pretty phenomenal industry. I've never seen anything like it before. I do love this industry. Yeah. It's a good industry. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have some more questions here. And I'm, there's some Texas ones, and then there's another federal one. So let me do the federal one, since we're on that right now. How will federal legislation affect current state laws, i.e., if THC levels go to 1%, will states have to increase from the current 0.3%? Is there a chance federal law will allow all cannabinoids? Jody's probably chomping on that one. The, the go for it, Jody. Yeah. Do it. But so so it, it seems like there's two questions. How, um, how how would the law affect all cannabinoids, and is there a chance that what was the first part? Is there a chance that that levels will go to one percent? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, I would say that, that among the various interested groups, a raise to a one percent THC cap is uh, probably a consensus point. Even where we may disagree on other things, most people understand that, that farmers need more flexibility. That one percent does not create some sort of a uh, you know uh, uh, a problem. So and that the previous uh, zero point three percent was arrived at rather unscientifically. So there's no reason to stick with that. And, and there's a general, I think that is probably one of the most likely things to, to, to be addressed in the next farm bill. Um, in terms of all cannabinoids, um, no. There, the farm bill is not going to uh, legalize more cannabinoids, um, but uh, as long as hemp is legal, uh, you know, innovation and exploration and, and uh, scientific, uh, uh, you know, uh, research is going to, you know, it was just a few years ago, we had under 100 identified major and minor cannabinoids. Now I think the list is over 130. So um, as, as, we, as we learn more about this plant, because keep in mind, research about the cannabis plant was nearly impossible since the, since the 30s. You couldn't just to even get, get research done. There was all types of roadblocks to make that hard. So we're really just beginning to explore the potential of this really remarkable varied plant and we're learning more and more. So as long as hemp stays legal, we're going to be finding more cannabinoids through that. And, and in that sense, there will be uh, more to come. I love it. Okay. So now we have a couple of Texas questions. Um, let's see. Does, does Perry's bill in Texas have legs? Um, how do I say that politely? I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. Um, there's been, there's a couple of bills proposed in Texas that are anti-hemp. Um, we don't believe that those will end up impacting us when this session is over. I'll say that. That's my, okay. That's my very polite response to that. I will also say that we are working on our own draft legislation that, um, is pretty comprehensive and we're, we're, we're working hard on it. So we're looking forward to getting that filed and moving forward with that. 
Uh, let's see. It, it, oh, real quick. So uh, keep in mind, we're doing weekly updates. Uh, not every update that we do weekly on the videos are about the Texas legislative session, but a lot of them are. Uh, it will, even if the video topic is something completely different, we'll typically chime in and give an update on the Texas legislative session because we know so many people are watching it right now. So it is something, just pay attention to our weekly videos and we'll typically update you with what's going on. And we try and give the most information we can at any given time. We can't, you know, it's still early on the session. We can't diverge, divulge our full strategy and tell everybody everything that we're doing for obvious reasons. Uh, but as the session progresses, it'll be more clear what we're doing and how we're doing it. And we'll be a lot more transparent with it. So this next question is, when Dishes came to our store and took product for testing, they specifically said they look for D8 products, and if they see them, they notify the local sheriff's office. It seems that Dishes, TDA, Texas Department of Agriculture, and Sid, Sid Miller, who is the Agriculture Commissioner, are at odds, as is the state advocates, I don't know who that is, and Dan Patrick, who's the Lieutenant Governor, can you all make a statement specifically about Texas government regulations this year? Okay. I'm giving that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all over the place. I can say with certainty that there is, um, you know, we were talking about this the other day, nobody's wrong and nobody's right. When hemp, when they were talking about the 2018 Farm Bill and legalizing, uh, effectively legalizing hemp, at the time, everybody was talking about the promise of you know, hemp rope and hemp houses and hemp sidewalks and all that good stuff. And then this other industry emerged. So some people feel like they were lied to or they, were, they carried a message that wasn't accurate. And none of that is true. At the time that this happened, this industry didn't really exist. It didn't exist. So no one was lied to at the time when we talked about hemp. The promise of hemp was like industrial hemp. And then this other thing happened. So part of the um, challenge specifically here in Texas is making people understand that they weren't lied to, they didn't carry a lie as a message, and that this is this brand new industry that actually propped up all the hemp farmers after the CBD market collapsed. So it actually gave a way out to all these farmers that had actually you know, invested so much in that. So there are always going to be people who uh, don't approve of a product or have a, a knee-jerk reaction about a product. There's nothing we can do about that. But most people, when you show them the facts, when you talk about the economic data, and I have another point on that later, when you talk about the economic data, when you give them the facts, they are willing to change their minds. They're willing to have their eyes open. Someone that goes into this thinking, oh, well, we were lied to, has a totally different position than someone who says, oh, I didn't realize an entire industry grew after this thing happened. It also changes when they see the people that are using the products and how much it changes their life. For sure. Um, you know, we're talking cancer patients, we're talking veterans with PTSD, we're talking people with sleep issues, people with anxiety issues. I mean, it's a very, very wide gamut of people that are using these products. And especially, you know, we're very passionate on the veteran side. We love all of our customers, but, you know, I'm a veteran. We're very passionate about the veterans and helping them. And, and working with the VFW has been phenomenal. But when, when people who don't like what we do speak to a veteran and see how much it changes their life and these, how these products impact their life, they tend to quickly back down. And, and that's, it's been, a, it's been a huge blessing for us that we've aligned with so many veterans and so many veterans are customers because I, I literally have endless testimonials of veterans saying how our products have changed their lives for the better. And one, I love that, but two, it hugely helps on the political side when you've got somebody who's saying that what we do is evil and it's not good. And then it's like, well, you know, what about all these veterans who are using these products and now have a better life? And, and there's not a, a great response for that from the other side. Yeah. Also about sh you know, notifying the sheriff's office about Delta Aid, and Lucas can jump in with more information on this if he wants, but Hometown Hero won an injunction against the state of Texas to allow Delta Aid products to remain on the market. Injunctions are granted when the judge believes that you have a very good shot in court 
to win when you go to trial. The injunction is still in place. It was granted on an administrative error that they committed, but we take the win, whatever. <laughs> we'll take the win. Um, but we get calls all the time about people who were stopped or arrested because they have Delta 8 products, which are fully legal. They're still legal. And we refer them to uh, our legal counsel, who's the guy who litigated uh, this particular matter with us. So if that actually happens, please, Feel free to contact us. If you feel like anything is being unfairly done to you because of the hemp products that you sell or that you consume, contact us and let us address it. Uh, we've had numerous stores contact us and say that, you know, certain state level agencies went in there and asked specifically for our product. That's great. I take that as a compliment. Please, please send our product out, have it tested, let us know the results when it comes back because we're very confident that it will be 100% legal and everything, we do full panel testing on all of our products. So I, I have no fear about any state level or federal agency testing our products because we're fully legal and we're fully compliant and we're very, very on top of that. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on full panel testing. Um, you know, you can see it in our COAs, they're, they're very comprehensive. And it is something that we're pushing the entire industry to move towards. If you are, you know, as a retailer, if you're carrying somebody's products and they aren't doing full panel testing, you need to tell them they need to do full panel testing. It's, it's, it's more expensive, but we've got to take this seriously. We've got, to, we've got to treat this industry like adults and as a sustainable long-term industry. And the only way to do that is to be very transparent with what's in the products and making sure that everything that we sell is fully legal. And every time that someone is arrested or given a citation or fine or whatever, for D8, it is a violation of our injunction. Correct. So please feel free to share that with us because we just send all that information to our lawyer for the case when it goes back to court. Also, we're, we're known for stepping in and helping too. Uh, we'll, we'll analyze the situation and make sure it, it is what it seems. Uh, but if somebody is being you know unfairly prosecuted or, or pursued based on just hemp products, we'll step in and help out where we need to. Can I just weigh in real quick and just follow up on that? Because I don't, I don't, I don't know if everybody is aware what full panel testing really means. Um, oh, so, so those COAs with the, the, the QR codes on, on, on the Delta 8 products, um, what they should take you to is a document that that is pretty long. And a full panel means testing not just for the cannabinoid content. And a lot of, uh, a lot of businesses are only attaching tests to show you what the, the cannabinoid content is. And with Delta-8 and Delta-10, THCA, THCP, THCO, any of, any of these products, um, the test should include tests for, for microbial uh, contaminants, metals, pesticides, solvents, and reagents. So it's not just about being lawful and being in compliance. It's also about the health of your, your consumers and your customers. So you need to safeguard them by making sure that the products on your shelves um, do all of the required testing to, to make it safe. Actually, that's a good lead-in for something I know Tammy wanted to talk about and Craig, which is, and I actually have another question here, but we'll come back to that before we wrap it up. So we are, oh, we're three minutes over, so let's make this quick. <laughs> so what do you think industry should do to preserve its future? In Texas, in, in New York, in general, what do you think industry should do? These are uh, rapid fire questions. Love oh. them, excellent question. <laughs> um, responsible industry. So one of the things that we've been doing, um, it's product standards and sort of the four corners of that, it's um, GMP or good manufacturing practices. And that means from a retail setting, know your brands, make sure that the products are man manufactured in sanitary conditions, broadly known as good manufacturing practices. Testing, appropriate testing protocols, both Lucas and Cynthia and Jody have tested on um, appropriate testing protocols, clean labels, that means what's in your product needs to be fully disclosed on your label, in addition to instructions for use or known caution or contraindication statements. And then the other is, which is one of the things that we've been chanting on the Hill, is the supply chain. I think with U.S. hemp farmers, we have a very clean supply chain, which is um, a rare thing, and so those are the four corners on the product standards that we've been um, trying to elevate in DC and have broader adoption with the industry. And the other is that I'll just loosely touch on since we're short on time. Um, hometown is uh, taking the lead on the Hill in DC. We may have some letter writing opportunities where we'll be looking for some signatures. 
um, and at, at some point maybe a more structured coalition of different members. But those are to, to stay in the game. That's what I recommend. Yeah, and to our Texas uh, retailers that are listening, I see you, Jody. Um, to the Texas retailers that are listening and consumers as well, we may also ask you guys for some help at a certain point, whether it's letter writing or maybe it's coming to the Hill uh, to meet with your representatives or something. But we are, we will do much better in this fight if we do it together. Uh, Jody? Real quickly on, on things that you can do to, to, to try to uh, avoid the, uh, the law coming down on you, two words, age verification. The most important thing you can do to, to not red flag your business is not and make sure that the products aren't ending up in the hands of kids. Yeah. Um, I think this question might be for Tammy or Jody or Craig. I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe it's you, Lucas. The question is, any comments pro or con on THC dominant cannabis seeds being classified as hemp product and now and so consequently federally legal? No, that, uh, because of the way they defined hemp. Uh, marijuana seeds have less than 0.3% uh, Delta 9 content, so they are technically hemp. They can now be bought, sold, and mailed. You're welcome. <laughs> New product. <laughs> Nothing to add. Nothing to add. Okay. Um, okay. So let's do a quick wrap. I'll finish. Lucas, final thoughts? Um, it, it's, it's becoming a, a very different sort of day and age now that we're seeing inflation and sort of some issues within the economy and some different things going on. And it's very much our goal to maintain our level of business for our consumers and for our retail partners. Um, you know, as you've probably noticed, we haven't raised our prices. We've also maintained our shipping time. And I don't think people fully realize how crazy supply chains are right now and how increasingly difficult it becomes to to really stay on top of, you know, our, our typical fulfillment times, 20, 24 hours, 24 business hours and we ship. Um, and so it's been really difficult to maintain that and also keep the pricing the same. And so, you know, for those of you that, that, you know, I guess don't really understand what goes on the background here, just know we have a lot of people that are working diligently to make sure that not only are these products here and they're sustainable, but also that we can get them to you as quickly as possible and that our prices don't change because we think that's really important for us. Craig? I would add that as we're looking towards impacting congressional action and the administration, the FDA's actions, as trite or cliche as it may sound, it really matters for members of Congress to hear from their constituents. And that can be business owners, uh, trade associations, but also just consumers and individuals. You know, so whether that means you're, you know, if you have an opportunity to meet your congressman at a local event or write a letter to the Hill or send an email, make a phone call, it all matters. I worked on Capitol Hill for, for eight years and, and it matters. If one person reaches out and says one thing, no, that doesn't change the, the view of a member of Congress, but it is something they pay attention to. It impacts their views. Uh, we mentioned earlier, we may be reaching out for, for support on group letters to Congress or to have people come. And I would encourage you to come to, to Washington, D.C. And, and meet with your members of Congress. It really it has an impact. Thank you. Uh, product safety. Know your brand and product safety. The Probably the something that can really impinge on this industry is an unfavorable headline. So um, know your product, stay close to your product line, and that just it's that direct line of your end users. Um, Hometown does a really good job of making sure that there is uh, follow through, it's called post-market surveillance, so, um, and no doubt all of you do that by staying in contact with your consumers and your end users. And the other is, as Jody said, youth access. So age gate or just know your end user and product safety. Thank you. Jody, final thoughts? Yeah, Hometown Hero is a leader in this industry and uh, we need more businesses to step up and do the right thing. And that means you know, not just the safety and, and standards, but also getting active, uh, being being advocates for this industry, and uh, you know we're proud to have uh, have them in our membership. So hope you'll uh, check out our website and join the fight. Yeah, one more plug for Jody and the HIA. Uh, they are a phenomenal group. People ask us all the time, who should we join? Who should we support? Uh, we fully endorse and recommend the Hemp Industries Association and, and working with Jody and all those guys. Last year, you know, we I think we contributed uh, and, and basically donated a couple hundred memberships to local partner stores of ours in Texas and, and help them get involved with Jody. 
um, will more than likely do that again this year and, and keep helping them grow and build. Uh, I don't, I, you know, this is something that might be uh, on a different call, but the Hemp Industries Association, the HIA, was essentially founded by Jack Herrera back in the 80s. And it, he, he had the foresight to understand that that group uh, was going to be leading the discussion around cannabis in this country going forward. And I, I think that that concept has fully come to fruition. And it's, it's an honor to work with Jody and the HIA. And for anybody on this call, please donate to them. Please help them out the best you can. Uh, we love the HIA and they do way more than anybody realizes for this industry. On that note, I will say we do love the HIA. Uh, and also, for those of you in Texas or really anywhere, we're happy to help. If you need help figuring out who your representative is, shoot us a note and we will be happy to help you. Um, everybody knows how to get in touch with us. Also, my final, final thought, final thought is, comment, we are a legitimate industry. Stop acting like a bunch of criminals. I mean, not that everybody's acting like criminals. Stop acting like they think we're criminals. We're legitimate, we belong here. So we need to act like it. We need to take our place and not let people push us around. We belong here and marijuana doesn't push us around. Legislators work for their constituents. Their constituents want our products. So let's act like the industry that we are. All right, thank you guys for joining us. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks.